right, welcome back. So we are going to continue our work uh, headed towards partial wave expansions, which is going to be part of our body of work of scattering theory, which is going to get us ready, of course, for the elements of QED that are all related to scattering. So it's a, a good deep dive, review dive back into scattering theory. And where we left off was we had completed Laplace's method and understood how to do an asymptotic expansion of a function of a real variable when it was given by an integral representation. And you'll notice it was a real integral representation. And we looked for peaks of this exponential function of the vari variable of integration. And assuming x is large, we came up with a very nice way of figuring out uh, asymptotics given this integral representation. And then we shifted from that into the method of stationary phase, where we again were looking for inter uh, for asymptotic forms, but now the integral representation involved this complex uh, argument for the exponential. And that was a lot of fun. And that was able to get us uh, warmed up about contour integration. And I'm really going to spend a lot of time covering different contour integrals, because I really feel like that is a soft spot that uh, students have approaching this, this subject. So we're going to do a bunch more contour integration, although the one we did was actually pretty good. But we haven't done for example, a theory of residues, you know, uh, residue and uh, uh, I guess it is called the theory of residues. But um, uh, so this was really important. Now, the next one we're going to do, but again, you had to have, in order for this to apply, the function of interest, right? We want the asymptotics for this function i, but you need to be able to express the function i as an integral, right? As an integral. And that seems like it's unusual, but it's not. There's a lot of integral representations for a lot of different functions. For example, this is sort of an obvious integral representation for sine of z. Seems a little weak because you've got cosine z in there, but there are others. I just chose this one because it was real. The others involve complex integrations that we're going to talk about today. But the point is we studied this method of stationary phase and we insisted on a certain kind of integral representation. Now today we're going to begin in principle the method of steepest descent, which now involves, again, we're looking for the asymptotic form of a function that is given as an integral representation. But this time, the integral representation is over a complex variable, dz, and the functions inside, g and this function, the argument, f, can both be complex. And you're dealing with a complex contour integration. So before we actually process this, which, you know, now that we know the two others, it's not going to be too hard. You know, we, we split it f of z into a real and a complex part, and then we have sort of a combination of stationary phase with Laplace's method. It's a little more subtle than that, but uh, that is what we're going to be aiming for. But we kind of have to believe that we have a contour representation of the function we care about. Remember, we're interested ultimately in the spherical Hankel function of the first kind, right? And we need to make sure we're comfortable with an integral representation. So any effort to understand the method of steepest descent's application to our case, which is this Hankel function, uh, the spherical Hopkel function now depends on, see, we've already gone down a rabbit hole, right? The rabbit hole is to understand the asymptotic form of this guy, so we can kind of own it in our minds. Well, the first step to owning it is to apply the method of steepest descent to an integral, for, integral representation of the Hunkel function. But if I just laid in front of you an integral representation, then we're just pushing back the layer of not understanding. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about the integral representation of the spherical Hankel function, and then we're gonna talk about the method of steepest descent probably in the next lecture. So we have something that we believe we can work on. Now look, this is obviously another rabbit hole, right? You know, we could just dive into the method of steepest descent and speak about it in the abstract, right? We break F up into a real and complex part, we expand f about a saddle point where f prime is zero. We substitute that in 
and uh, we substitute in the value of f uh, into this exponential. We make some assumptions and approximations that are based on large values of our argument, of course, which is the key here. And we just process it and process it. And then we start applying some knowledge of analytic functions in the complex plane. That's the hard part. And with that knowledge, we realize that saddle points are a thing. And we end up with a formula just like we ended up with before, right? where we do have to now think very carefully about how to pass through this special point uh, called the saddle point. So, but in order to do any of that, you still have to believe that you have a function that'll give you some, uh, you have an integral representation that, and a function f, right? And so that's what we're gonna do today. So let's begin that. So we start with the definition of our spherical Hunkel function of order nu, which will be an integer and uh, of the first kind. And the definition of this is it's the regular Hunkel function or the, uh, or the, the, uh, the regular Bessel function of the third kind, type one, I suppose, which is of half integral order. So nu is now uh, an integer plus half. That nu looks like an n, doesn't it? And this, uh, this is, a, and then this function multiplied by the square root of pi over 2z. So that's, our, that's by definition, right? So this is how this thing is defined. And we are now asking the question, okay, if we want the asymptotic form of this, we've reduced it to finding the asymptotic form of the um, regular Hunkel function of half integral order of the first kind. Right, so now we're focusing on this guy right here because the answer is just going to be multiplied by uh, z to the basically it's going to go to z to the one half, an extra z to the minus one half. So now, how do we attack this? Well, once we're in the realm of the regular Bessel functions, meaning the Bessel function of the first kind, second kind, and third kind, um, we can always just study the first kind. Uh, presume the second kind and, and just use the combinations of the first and second kind to get the third kind. So we know that the differential equation for the Bessel function, the ordinary Bessel function, is this guy right here. You remember the spherical Bessel function had a, a 2 here, right, which made a lot of difference, right? That was a big difference. And um, uh, But we know that we can get from this differential equation through the method of Frobenius right, to this series solution result. And that's, you know, that's a rabbit hole that if you haven't gone down, you're supposed to go down because you're supposed to feel comfortable with a Frobenius method. And ultimately, uh, there is no restriction on what we're calling alpha here. In fact, I should be a little bit careful because that what we have as new here should probably be Right, it should probably be alpha, right, alpha squared, to, in order to jive with. I'm sure I'm going to screw this up again, but this alpha in this definition is, in fact, the number that shows up in the Bessel equation uh, in this part of the differential equation, right? This minus alpha squared. It's a constant, and in our work, you know, this constant looked like uh, l l plus one, you know, in various times, but it doesn't have to, right? This could be any number. And in fact, this form is not easily derived from the method of Frobenius. The method of Frobenius doesn't land, for example, with this gamma function in the denominator. You have to actually choose an arbitrary constant uh, multiplier in order to simplify the denominator to get this gamma function. But this is the one that we use. This is sort of very standard and canonical. And that gamma function is down there. Again, Another rabbit hole. What do we need to know about a gamma function in order to understand the Bessel function? And the gamma function is one of those critical functions of mathematical physics. And actually, of, I should just say mathematics. It's more a mathematical object than it is a mathematical physics object. And the things that students need to know about the gamma function are probably, you know, these three things would cover you. This one is probably the big one. Right, that the gamma function of a complex number plus one is the complex number times the gamma function of the complex number. So that's that's almost a defining relationship. You can get very far from understanding this. 
But there, it has an integral representation that is of legendary fame and almost is the defining expression for the function. It's so important. So this is uh, something that you should always recognize as the definition of the gamma function. And it does show up quite a bit. It shows up with weird things in these integrals that when you make some variable now, weird things in these arguments, these exponentials. And when you make certain variable transformations, you can end up with this gamma function. And this is a pretty useful fact also. But we're not going to go down the rabbit hole of studying the gamma function. We are going to presume it. But there is one relationship of the gamma function that you ha we have to believe, right? You know, we could rabbit hole this thing and figure it out. But the gamma function itself, the reciprocal of the gamma function, has this very famous integral representation. And it's a complex integral representation. T here is a complex variable, and this represents a complex contour. So the reciprocal of the gamma function is equal to this integral representation, which is a exactly the kind of integral representation we're looking for, right? It's a complex contour integration of, uh, you know, of a, of a function and, um, uh, uh, e to the minus a complex number, right? In this case, the the f of the f of t is actually minus t, which is nice and simple. But this, the limits of this integration is designed to represent uh, a, a, a a contour on the complex plane. You you wouldn't write it this way because it's not a closed contour, right? If you have the complex plane and you start here and you're gonna you know, do some integration and come back there, then you can say, okay, if you integrate on this contour, you, you, can, you can write the sort of the, 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 the closed contour integral. This isn't quite that. I don't know if there's a good symbol for an, uh, a contour that doesn't close, but this is not meant to be a closed contour. This is meant to be the following contour. This is the complex plane axis. This is the imaginary. This is the real axis. The contour is supposed to come come in from infinity, go around the origin in the positive direction, which is counterclockwise. So it goes around the origin counterclockwise and goes back to infinity. And basically the branch cut of this thing is from the origin and it's the entire real axis. So you never cross that branch cut. And you can see why, right? T, um, uh, the branch cut probably, it comes from this guy right here, right? If you move T in different circles, if Z is not an integer, then you're going to get multi-valued. This is basically multi-valued in the complex plane, right? So if Z were to wander in a circle around the origin like this, each time it loops the origin, this guy is not going to return to its original values. In other words, if you did this contour, by the time you got back there uh, to where you started, it wouldn't have the same value unless z is very particular. But we're not restricting z. Uh, this is the function of a complex variable. So because of that, this is a multi-valued function, and as such, you need to introduce a branch cut. That Consider that part of the prerequisite review of complex analysis. If branch cuts are uncomfortable for you, this is something you need to understand because a lot of QED and, well, uh, QED has its plenty of moments where you're doing contour integration and a few that you really have to understand it pretty solidly. Um, I'll give an example uh, later in, in, the, uh, in the lesson. But regardless, this we are going to accept this. We're not going to go down the rabbit hole of showing that integration along this contour will give you uh, the reciprocal of the gamma function of z. Notice, by the way, I didn't draw this contour very precisely, right? And of course, you don't have to draw it very precisely because another fact from complex analysis is that the contour I just draw, drew in blue is exactly the same as the contour I'm drawing right now in green, as long as they both end up at infinity and they go around the origin uh, in some loop. Now, the advantage of some contours is that some contours that when you specifically draw in certain ways can be integrated, 
using standard techniques. Other contours, like this one, for example, would be a real bear to integrate, right? So choosing a contour is an art form, right? You've got to choose one that's legitimate for your problem, but you have a lot of freedom because you can deform contours. Notice deform is different than arbitrarily change, of course. And within certain parameters, you can deform the contours. And you deform them to take full advantage of whatever clever technique you're trying to implement. Anyway, as I said, we're going to accept this. And the reason this is useful is because here we have the reciprocal of the gamma function. So I can now take this guy and exploit this and re make a one direct replacement. And that process is, I've done it here in LaTeX. I hope I didn't make any errors, but I'm sure somebody please point out if I did. But here's our reciprocal gamma function. And now we're going to replace it with this its integral formulation. There's the contour integral, um, the uh, t minus t to the mu is right there, or minus t to the minus mu, that comes from this part, and uh, I think doesn't it? No, 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 no. The uh, look how this was structured: minus t to the minus z, where z is the argument. Right, the z is the argument of the gamma function. So in this case, the argument of the gamma function is nu plus r plus one. So you end up there with minus nu minus r minus one. And then this e to the t, this piece comes from here. And of course, the integration is with respect to t, which is the same t as that. And so that, after that, it's just a bunch of simplifying things, right? Uh, uh, we're separating r's and t to the minus r and pulling out the t to the new minus one. I, I guess I want to keep the, uh, uh, oh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a series solution here that we recognize, right? And if you proceed this way, you'll end up with a series that looks like an exponential, right? So we're looking for something raised to the power over a power factorial. So by factoring out by, and, and R is going to be that thing, right? So uh, we pull out that R. What happens to this T minus R? Uh, what happened? Oh, it lands here in the denominator of this guy, right? So that T minus T to the minus R ends up living in here. And I think this minus sign ends up uh, walloping this guy because you have minus to the minus r, and then you have minus 1 to the r. So that those cancel. And you end up with this, which, of course, is the exponential, uh, the Gaussian exponential, which is nice. And uh, a lot of this depends on Gaussian exponentials, right? And then you just uh, proceed by combining this e to the minus t in there. And then this guy we throw into the denominator. And then x to the mu over 2, that comes out because the variable of integration is dt, so x over 2 to the mu doesn't matter. And so this, this is actually a completely legitimate integral representation of j mu of x, right? That's a legitimate integral representation. And you'll find this integral representation in the canon. And so what happens next is a lot of integral representations are just known integral representations with variable transformations. So in this case, we do this variable transformation, t equals ux over 2. So we're introducing this variable u, right? And in this form, and then um, this will uh, uh, have the effect of, well, it has the effect of a bunch of things. But if you go ahead and you make that substitution, uh, you end up just sort of converting the, the f integral form representation we just derived into this one here, which is the one we're going to actually use. And this guy down here is the integral representation we're going to work with. And you can follow the logic. Uh, the logic's not too difficult. Oh, there is one step that's important. And that step is that we flip we uh, flip these my, this infinity from the right to the left, and uh, that's so now now our contour of integration goes like this, 
Right? So that was that's an important step. So this is now the integral representation. And look, it's in the form that we want, right? It's in the form of g, let's see, it's got a g of x, right? And that would be this thing right here. And it's got x, f of x. And this is that thing up, oops, not f, f of x, um, f, x of yeah, actually, I'm sorry, both of these have to be, the, the variable of integration is u now, right? It's u. So this is g of u and x f of u, right? So that is the form that we're after. And so we have accomplished that for the Bessel function of the first kind. So we could ask, well, does this actually solve the differential equation? I mean, that's a way of getting confidence with this, right? We, we asked the question, does our integral representation for this solve the differential equation of Bessel's differential equation? And it should, but we do want to know if it does. And also, how does this get us to the Hunkel function's integral representation? So let's have a look at those two ideas. They, they're, those two ideas actually come together. All right, so the way we're going to do this is we are going to solve, or wrestle with problem 11.1.16 from uh, Arfkin's book. Remember uh, Arfkin and Weber, Mathematical Methods for Physicists. It's a great book. And uh, a lot of the stuff that's important is in the problems, actually. So it is nice to do the problems. But here you see that in problem 11.16, the book asks, show by direct differenti differentiation and substitution that this integral form of or integral representation of the Bessel function solves the Bessel's equation. And notice uh, there's an equivalent version here. And this is the one we, we derived first, right? And then we converted, we converted this guy <laughs> into this guy. But we're going to work with this version of it. And they, they give you, they tell you, they say direct differentiation and substitution. That means you're going to take this, this integral form, you're going to differentiate it appropriately and substitute it into Bessel's differential equation. But if you did that, it actually would be pretty hard um, because you would just end up with uh, a really big mess of things and you would still have to figure out the integral along the contour. So Arfkin, understanding that this is difficult, says, so I'm going to tell you the secret here, the hint. Show that the total integrand, after you substitute this into Bessel's differential equation, may be written as a total derivative. And then he gives you the literal total derivative here. What's important is that, you know, this hint didn't have to do this, right? This hint could have stopped here. And it would have said, after substituting into diff Bessel's differential equation, the integrand is actually a total derivative. So we have to understand, what is the advantage of being a total derivative? And how do we show that the integrand is a total derivative? But be, So it's a little unclear what Arfkin wants in the sense that uh, giving you this hint is very, very helpful by, by providing the total derivative that this integrand is supposed to be. And we're going to fully exploit this because actually, to be honest, I don't know how to, to do it otherwise. With this, I can do it. But without it, I can't. But the point is, we just got to show it. And we got to understand why is this important. So that's what we're going to do. Oh, here's the contour, by the way, the new contour. Still, it's, it's notice it's still counterclockwise, but it goes from minus infinity counterclockwise. Now the branch cut is along the negative branch, right? Okay, so let's begin uh, by looking at substituting this cat directly into the differential equation. And the way we'll do that is we take the Bessel cup function and we just write it down. This is our integral representation. And then its first derivative, notice it's with respect to x, right? So it's not very difficult to take the first derivative, but that derivative slips through the integral, which is really important. And we end up with this expression for the first derivative. And the second derivative just brings down another factor of z minus 1 over z over 2. So you end up with this 1 fourth. And so now we have these three uh, 
the, the Bessel function, its first derivative and its second derivative. And what's our assignment? Our assignment is direct differentiation. Well, we've done that. Now insert it into the differential equation. Um, so I don't need this. So we here's the di differential equation. We've got this. We're going to insert that from there. We're going to take this. We're going to insert that from there. We're going to take this from the beginning. And we end up with this integral, right? Uh, taking these guys, substituting in here, gives us this long integral right here. And this is a bit of a, of a mess, right? I mean, there's a lot going on here. You still have to execute the integration. So the trick, uh, evidently, is to show that the integrand is a total derivative of something. That means there's some function out there, right? There's some function f, of, of z. Notice it's a function of f of z, not a function of x. It's a function of f of z because what we're after is a total derivative of that, that can be that put under the integral sign is an advantage to us. So there's some function out there, f of z, such that d by dz of this function f of z gives you this mess right in here. Now, can you do that? Can can uh, is there anybody watching this that is got the chops to figure out from just looking at this, right? There is a procedure that is very helpful to do this. Uh something a uh, uh, sort of a generalized um a generalized Laplace transformation. It's an interesting procedure, but we're not going to do it, but just by looking at this, and certainly Arfkin didn't expect us to do that. But can you tell that there is a function out there, f, such that d by dz of f is this integrand? Because if there was, what would happen? Well, if there was, then you would replace the integrand by d by dz of f of z dz, and that's basically by the fundamental theorem of calculus. I kind of did a lot of extra work here. But by the fundamental theorem of calculus, that would just mean that the result of the integral is just the value of x at the two endpoints of the contour. That's just the fundamental theorem of calculus works in um, complex analysis and just as it does in real analysis. So you would just take that function f of t, if you knew what it was, and evaluate it you know, uh, at minus infinity e to the minus i pi and infinity e to the i pi, which is exactly these two endpoints here, right? This endpoint is um, infinity times e to the i pi, where that angle is pi, and then this is infinity e to the minus i pi, where that angle is minus i pi. So those would be considered the two endpoints. And of course, the what it really is, is it really is, um, I, I suppose the way you really need to write this is, is capital R, capital R, and you're taking the limit as R goes to infinity, of course. That's how you do improper integrals, right? So, so the advantage of, so that's why Arfkin is so hyped here about this, right? He says, hey, look, the derivative of this guy with respect to t is going to be the same as if you take all the appropriate derivatives of the Bessel function, insert it into Bessel's differential equation, uh, that's going to turn out to be the derivative of this guy. So it turns out the integrand is in fact a total derivative. So how do we check that? Well, you know, all we can do is we take Arfkin's hint and we take the derivative of this expression. I've got it in terms of the variable z here instead of t. But you can take the derivative of this with respect to z. Now it's a bit of a mess, right? Because you have three, pro you have basically a triple product, right? But it's doable. And this is the triple product. So now the issue is, can we show that this triple product or triple uh, product rule application to the hint given by Arfkin is, in fact, the same as this guy down here, right? And I checked, 
and it is, <laughs> I, I ran it in Mathematica, and they both expand fully to this expression. So the two are, in fact, the same, which now means that we can replace f of z with the hint and f of t with the hint, and here's the hint, and now we just have to evaluate the hint at the two endpoints. And sure enough, if you do that, you'll discover that uh, this that, that at the two endpoints, at these two particular endpoints, this goes to zero. Now, look how much trouble that saved us by recognizing this amazing fact that you have a total differential here. That saved us all the trouble of evaluating the, the integral, or first of all, you know, defining this integral very specifically. In other words, we would have to say, okay, let's go out to here, then around the contour, and then back out to here, and then specify the integral quite precisely, and then attempt to integrate each leg, meaning the, the, the inbound leg, the circular leg, and the outbound leg, and then somehow adding those up together. Um, you know, it's definitely most contour integration is in fact done that way, and we will be doing some that way. But once you recognize this, you know, you save yourself all that trouble, and all you have to do is check it at the endpoints. And that's what Arfkin's problem wants you to do. So now that just shows, so I guess in summary, right, we've, take, we've definitely, let me erase everything, we've definitely taken, we did the obvious thing, right, which was, which was took the appropriate derivatives, put them in Bessel's differential equation and got a large expression. And then we exploited this observation, which was gifted to us by Arfkin. And we discovered that, yes, indeed, um, this integral representation, those derivatives, they match this beautiful total derivative, which uh, evaluates to zero at the two endpoints. So indeed, the, this integral representation is, in fact, a solution of Bessel's differential equation. So now we've got a solid, believable representation for uh, the Bessel function. That's of exactly the form we want. So now we have to turn this into a form that uh, represents our Hunkel function. And we are going to lean on this, whoops, where is it? Uh, up here. We are going to lean on this gifted total derivative to do that. So let's have a look at the next step. All right, so we'll take this uh, snapshot out of uh, Arfkin's book. I need to credit that book, of course, if I'm going to use their problem. And uh, so we've, we've got our, we're, we're, we're happy with our Hunkel contour representation of the Bessel function. Ignore this. This is yet a different representation of the Bessel function. But we're dealing with this guy right up here, and we're happy with that. And we know that when that when this integration is executed along this specific contour, we uh, we solve Bessel's differential equation. Now, the part of complex analysis that comes in is we can now deform this contour anywhere we want, as long as we end up at infinity there. You know, this contour here is also just as legit, right? And, in fact, so is, say, this contour, right? Well, I guess that's absurd. Of course, those two are the same. This, they're meant to be arbitrary with the uh, condition that nobody crosses the branch cut, right? And you don't, uh, you don't, well, crossing the branch cut's the big, the big deal. You can't do that. So now we're going to ask the question is, well, is there anywhere else along this contour where the value is zero, because if there was, we could, we, could, uh, we could take the contour and we could shorten it, right? We have e to the minus i pi here, and we have infinity e to the i pi up at top. But if somewhere along this contour there was another zero, say there's this point for some reason, this point right here, say uh, our function, our function of which the total derivative is our integral, right? This is the function, I guess we're going to call that function f of t. You know, if in our 
our integral is d by dt of f of t by some miracle, that seems to be the case, uh, if we found another point where f of, say, call that point p, f of point p equals zero, then this contour from, my, uh, from infinity e to the minus i pi, this contour would also satisfy Bessel's equation. Right? But there is no such point along the contour as drawn, right? As drawn, uh, the only points along the contour as drawn are these two out here. The good news, of course, is we can deform these contours, which I pointed out a moment ago. So is there another point in the complex plane where our function f of t, not d by dt of f of t, but f of t, uh, goes to zero? And so we are going to look at the function and say, okay, is, can we find another point t other than these infinities where, it's, where this, this guy here is zero? And we're going to choose the point t equals zero, right? What, if, what happens at t equals zero? Well, this term here obviously blows up. So t equals zero literally isn't going to uh, do it. But as t approaches zero, as the complex number t approaches zero, this becomes a tremendously big number, but you got that negative sign, right? So because of that, if we approach t as zero on the real axis, right? It has to get hit zero. We have to do it along the real axis. Then this will become an exponential of a large, very large uh, negative number. And this exponential will drive everything to zero. And the rest of this stuff is just not going to compete because you only have polynomials of t blowing up, right? You know, as t approaches zero along the real line, this is going to get large, and so is this, uh, assuming nu is positive, right? And But it won't compete with this exponential that's killing it, right? And this first part of the exponential as t approaches zero is going to be one. So we have to approach t along the real line but we, so we're going to consider the deformation of this contour. We're going to come along like this, and then we're going to come along the real line. Is that a good picture of it? Let's see. Uh, you would come along the real line like that. And that's the, the contour we're going to consider. And for that contour, all of a sudden, uh, uh, yeah, our function is zero. But is that a solution of... Bessel's equation, right? Just because I can change the contour and, and have it go to zero, but you know the question is, is this thing here a solution of Bessel's equation? And um, I want to keep the same contour, though. I, I want to keep... I, I still need to maintain... I need to deform this whole contour. So likewise, I'm going to emerge from zero and then rejoin the contour. And then if I add those two things together, I'll definitely get a solution of Bessel's equation. So the idea now is that this lower contour does in fact solve Bessel's equation, right? That was the whole point, right? It's zero as you approach uh, the origin, the, the, the right end point of this lower part of the contour approaches, uh, as it approaches zero along the real axis, has a value of zero. And this left endpoint we've already shown has a value of zero. So we know that this guy solves the Bessel equation. And uh, also we know that this contour added to this contour is going to equal our Bessel function, the, the Bessel function uh, j sub nu of x. So what ends up we do, what we do now is we define that upper contour the upper one, this is the one coming uh, from leaving zero and going to infinity, that is an integral representation of the Hankel function of the first kind, and this is an integral representation of the Hankel function of the second kind. And if you add the two together, you get this expression here for the, uh, uh, sorry, this expression here, for the Bessel function. You'll notice there was a like a typo in Arfkin. This i, it looks like a subscript on pi, but clearly that is supposed to just be an i. So likewise here, I guess. So uh, uh, 
So we are now, we've now got what we sought. We were seeking the uh, integral representation of the Hunkel function, the ordinary, well, the Hunkel function of the first kind. And this is what we're going to study the asymptotics of. It's a contour integral. It is of the form that we're interested in, right? This part here is g is, whoops, not g, I think we called it, this part here is f of t, um, including the, the 2, and this part here is what we're calling g of t, and this is now set up for our spherical defense, de, uh, descent issue. And if we combined these two together and divided by 2, we would end up with our definition of the uh, uh, Bessel function. So we know that they kind of combine the right way. But the point is, is that this is now the integral representation we sought. And I went through this for a couple of reasons. One is I wanted to sh discuss this, the, the power of deforming a contour, right? The power of deforming a contour, it's something you've really got to understand in complex analysis. And so we wanted to see that. We wanted to study, uh, get some we wanted to sort of go down the rabbit hole of the integral representation for the Bessel function, which we did. And, you know, there's rabbit holes we didn't go down, right? We didn't pursue, you know, the derivation of this expression. We just accepted it as given. Every time you accept something as given, you're denying a rabbit hole. We did not go down the rabbit hole of the gamma function, right, of that integral representation of the gamma function. But we did go down this rabbit hole, which was, uh, the, the upshot, it was based on uh, Arfkin's problem 11.1.6, and this analysis here is also in Arfkin, in case uh, you want to review it a little more. Uh, it's not quite as thorough as we did it, but it gets it. It's on page 660, section 11.4. Uh, you can see the discussion of uh, of of the... Um, getting this integral representation for the Hankel function. And this is the one we're going to use. Now, the significance of the deformation of the contours. Let me just touch on that before we stop. So this is like a legendary quantum field theory book. A good example of a very typically used text. It's the one I used. Uh, we use a lot of different texts, but this is quite the, the, the excellent book. And right in the very beginning, in, I don't know what page is, page 28, right? This is like the introductory section. You see this picture. And this picture, this is the complex plane, right? It's a very abstractified form. And here's two branch cuts in the complex plane. So right away, I mean, page 28, right? You're talking about branch cuts in the complex plane, and not trivial branch cuts either. This is kind of a tricky one where you have a branch cut going, uh, covering two different sections of the plane. And here's a contour right there in the middle of it. And then the book says, oh, well, what we're going to do is we're going to push this contour around this branch cut. And that sounds an awful lot like what we did, right? We were talking about this contour here and then just sort of deforming it into some other contour, for example. But this is not a deformation, right? And this is why your complex analysis has to be solid. You, if you look at this and all you did was think push, this is wrong. You can't just take a straight line contour that's going from, you know, going from, uh, you know, minus infinity to plus infinity to plus infinity and turn it to something that's going to, I don't know, I guess, where is it going? It's going to um, uh, infinity times e to the i pi over 2 right? On, and, you know, up and down here, you just can't do that. So what you have to be able to kind of understand because your, your complex analysis is good enough is to realize that what's really happening here is you've got a contour that looks like this in the con complex plane here, or I guess here's our complex plane. And here's the, those two poles with the two branch cuts. And the original contour goes like this. What you're actually doing is you're deforming it to a contour that looks like this. You're deforming it to, I guess you're going up, down, around, and down like that. 
and then uh, and, and that I think you can do right because that's a deformation right and you're not crossing the branch points and all this stuff but you've got these arcs to deal with right and Peskin and Schroeder, they don't deal with the arcs. They kind of tell a quick story here. This isn't a deep analysis of theirs. This is just an introductory idea in the early part of the book. But the point is, is that if you don't understand your complex analysis, something like this could be really, really confusing. And in fact, it is. Um, but uh, uh, the rest of the book's great. But, but my point is, is here right away, you're faced with complex analysis in QED. And I just wanted to provide this example so you understand why we're kind of reviewing these topics. Okay, so next time we're going to take our new Hunkel contour and execute the method of steepest descents and finally track down our asymptotic form. See you next time.